Thank you, Julie. And uh, great to see also people uh, coming from uh, several sectors. As in this session, we wanted to talk about uh, multi-sectoral approaches to prevention. Uh, my name is uh, Chiara Cerriotti. I work as um, Prevention Focal Point at the Alliance for Child Protection in a Humanitarian Action, seconded from uh, Plan International, and um, I will be your uh, facilitator uh, for uh, today. In uh, this uh, session, we will uh, discuss Uh, how to how preventing uh, harm to children is uh, central in uh, the humanitarian uh, response uh, and is uh, everyone's responsibility and uh, every sector uh, business. Uh, our speakers will uh, describe uh, uh, new guidance and uh, program examples that will show how the collaboration between uh, uh, different sectors is uh, necessary to reduce and prevent uh, child protection harmful outcomes and increase uh, children's uh, well-being. We will go through um, three main presentations and we will have uh, some time for questions from the audience. At the end, it will be an interactive uh, session, so we will uh, ask you to engage with our speakers and participate in some uh, breakout uh, 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 rooms. If uh, through the session you have uh, reflections, thoughts, uh, questions, uh, please uh, uh, you're welcome to drop them in the chat and we will get back to questions towards uh, uh, the end. Our first intervention uh, will show how health workers can take a child-centered approach and play an important role in um, identifying child abuse and neglect, or also identifying children at high risk and so protecting them from experiencing uh, violence. So at this point, we are um, pleased to welcome our first speaker, Stephanie Burrows. Stephanie is a technical officer in the Prevention of Violence team at the World Health Organization. Uh, please, Stephanie, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Chiara. And hello to all the participants. I'm really thrilled to be here. And as mentioned today, I will briefly present on strengthening the health sector response to violence against children. Next slide, please. And from, a globe, from the global prevalence studies, we know that the different forms of violence against children are very widespread, but this is often underestimated even by some health professionals. It's high prevalence means that health professionals are really likely to encounter children or adolescents who have experienced violence. Next, please. And violence against children can have severe immediate consequences, including death, severe injury, and disability. Next, please. But the consequences can also last a lifetime. Sorry, this is the one slide up, please. Um, this one, yeah. Uh, there should be one in between. Um, anyway, just to say that violence against children is linked to a variety of psychological problems, sexual and reproductive health consequences, and high-risk health behaviors such as alcohol and drug abuse which in turn are linked to long-term physical health problems like cardiovascular disease and cancer. And violence against children can also affect a cognitive and academic performance and increases the likelihood of uh, perpetrating violence later in life. The next slide, please. Uh, but violence against children often goes unnoticed despite the high prevalence and the detrimental consequences. So violence against um, very few children and adolescents disclose abuse and around 75% of children don't tell anybody immediately. And the ones who disclose abuse often would rather tell their peers than official services. Less than 10% of children who have experienced violence actually have access to services, and in some countries it's as low as 1%. Disclosure is often delayed by many years, and younger children are less likely to disclose abuse. Next, please. The children struggle to disclose abuse because of feelings of shame, embarrassment, fear, uncertainty about what is abusive, and difficulty communicating about the abuse. And when violence is perpetrated by caregivers or the caregiver allowed the violence to occur, it is much more difficult to disclose. Next slide, please. And in particular, very young children are at higher risk of abuse and have fewer opportunities to seek help. Next, please. And so this is where the role of health professionals becomes very important, especially for young children. Health professionals are often the first and maybe the only contact, a point of contact 
and their encounter with children during a routine visit might be the only opportunity to recognize child maltreatment. Therefore, health professionals play a critical role in identifying and addressing the health and psychosocial needs of children affected by violence. They can mitigate negative consequences of violence, and they may decrease the future risk of repeated victimization. Next slide, please. So at the WHO, um, to equip health professionals and other disciplines with knowledge and skills to recognize and address violence against children, we have several resources. We published a clinical handbook for health professionals in August last year. We are developing an in-person training program and a scenario-based online training. And we plan to step up work with training institutions to integrate violence against children into, into pre-existing curricula. And we aim to work with other disciplines to mainstream the response to violence against children into programs such as integrated management of childhood illness. Next slide, please. So the essence of what WHO recommends is some small but very important steps of staying alert to signs and symptoms of violence, safely asking about it, and helping to address immediate health and safety needs by applying first line support. This includes being aware of the typical signs and symptoms of, associated with abuse and involves listening to and carefully observing the child and adolescent and their caregiver. And WHO does not recommend universal screening for violence of all children attending health care as this can cause serious harm. But WHO does encourage clinical inquiry. This means that when a child or adolescent exhibits signs or symptoms of violence, the trained healthcare worker inquires about potential exposure to violence in a compassionate, non judgmental manner that ensures the child's safety, privacy, and confidentiality. It is important to use a child centered communication approach that is appropriate for the child's age and uh, takes the, involves them in the decision making. Providing first line support means identifying and responding to the child or adolescent's different needs, validating their experiences and concerns helping them feel connected to others and empowering them to seek help. Next slide, please. With that very brief overview, we are now going to break you up into very small groups. There will be three to five people in each group with different roles. So one person will be the patient, a 10-year-old uh, boy uh, called that I have named Kai, but you're welcome to change the name. Um, and this 10-year-old child has come to the clinic with their caregiver for routine vaccinations. The person playing this role should respond to the healthcare professional as appropriate. And the second person would be the healthcare professional who prepares to give the injection, but then notices a bruise on Kai's forearms and near his eye. And as a health professional, what would you say to the child regarding your observations? The other people in the group would be the observer who watched this interaction. And so to decide who would play which role, to make it easier, we uh, please go alphabetically according to the first name, the first letter of your first name. So the person whose name comes first in the alphabet would be the patient. The person whose name comes second in the alphabet will be the health professional, and the other people in the group would be um, observers. And so the first part of the would be a role play between the patient and the healthcare uh, professional, and then the second part would be to discuss the feedback questions which are listed on the slide here. And this slide will be available in the breakout rooms for referral. And you'll have about seven to eight minutes in the breakout groups um, in which to do the role play and to answer those questions. And then at the end, we'll come back to the main group. Um, and hopefully there will be groups that would like to volunteer to say what they have learned. Um, but otherwise, I will just uh, choose some particular groups. So please be sure to have your uh, replies ready. I'll now hand over to Julie to organize the groups. Thanks. Oh, great. Well, I welcome back to the plenary session and I hope you enjoyed your group work and we will now have a, a short discussion of how the group work went and to share what you learned through the exercise. And if you could just show my last slide, please, because while we do this, I would like to show the last slide, which gives more information about what is included in the clinical handbook for healthcare professionals that I mentioned earlier. As you can see, it covers a lot of topics. And today I briefly mentioned some of them. And in the group work, we just briefly touched on how to communicate with children where violence is suspected. Um, but you can read that in your own time as we uh, talk about what the group work. So uh, are there any 
volunteers from the group to uh, say what they've learned about communicating with children, or I can choose one. And I think you can unmute yourself at this point uh, to answer. Okay, should I select group two? Will someone from group two uh, maybe say what you what you learned from this experience and how you found it? Um, maybe let me. I mean, I, I'm not sure I was group two. <laughs> not in the group, but okay. Um, okay, great. Can I say something? Please go ahead. Okay. Um, so I was with um, Sarah Aris with and and, and John. And I, I play the role of, of observer. And I can see that um, the conversation was great. There is a lot of participation between the patient and the, and the clinical professional. So they try to, um, the, the, the clinical professional try uh, um, to give um, lots of information about uh, vaccination and other things and try to ask as well the, the patient how he feels and how, uh, what, she, uh, what he would like to know well about the vaccination. So I think that is a great atmosphere between patient and, uh, and the clinical profession. That was good to me. Great, thanks so, thanks so much for, for volunteering. Um, and I think, Kiara, if I understand correctly, the time is almost up, so we probably can't um, have a, have anybody else. I was going to say the Nigerian Hub has their hand up. If you want to just hear from them for just oh, a I'd moment. I'd love to, if that's okay, Kiara. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So this is the Nigerian Hub, and we have the role play where you have the patients, the healthcare professional and the observer. So from the role play it was we observed that um, the healthcare observer, uh, the healthcare professional, sorry, um, when the patient came, the healthcare professional gave the usual um, talk before the whole um, injection, the whole process. So before then she observed the wounds and she asked what happened, but it was observed that the patient was hesitant to respond. She was shy and she was, according to her, she was scared of more um, abuse if she disclosed what happened. And the healthcare professional was able to administer the injections, but also um, assured her that she can always come back to uh, give her complaints or to report any form of abuse whenever she's comfortable. Great. I mean, that sounds fabulous because I think part of dealing with children is to, um, I think often children would be very shy to say something and to ask like open-ended questions and not to be judgmental at all, to be patient and calm, to say to the child, you can come back. So it sounds like um, the, the people in your group did extremely well on that. Um, so well done uh, to the groups and sorry for the time, I think we have to probably sum up. Um, but just to say that what I'd like to end off is off with is that you know really healthcare providers are likely to encounter children and adolescents who have experienced violence in the course of their normal working you know, activities, and they're actually in a unique position to help these uh, children um, to observe the signs and to be there for the child. And just small steps like recognizing the signs and symptoms, uh, addressing the health and safety needs. Uh, and applying like first line support can make an enormous difference in the lives of millions of children. Thanks very much, over. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, also thank you to, um, to you all for uh, engaging in uh, this um, 
uh, discussion and highlighting also some uh, uh, considerations from uh, the work in uh, your uh, own context and uh, challenges. And uh, thanks, Stephanie, I think, uh, uh, for making us uh, reflect also on uh, uh, barriers to disclosure and identifying uh, child abuse and the key role of uh, uh, health workers as a first point of uh, contact to identify violence uh, and also children at risk. So identifying those early signs that might help to, um, uh, to prevent further uh, uh, violence from uh, happening. Uh, now we are uh, moving away from uh, health uh, and we are going to look at uh, a program example of uh, how multi-sectoral a multi-sectoral approach that involves uh, uh, child protection, education and uh, nutrition actors and at the same time promotes community ownership can contribute to positive outcomes for children. Again, if you have any thoughts, reflections, or questions during the session, you are welcome to drop them in the chat. And at this point, we welcome our next speakers, Elam Firrici, who is the Child Protection Manager for Street Child in Nigeria, and James Jabani, Program Manager for Life at Best Development Initiative in Nigeria. Elam and James, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Clara. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure, colleagues, to talk to you this afternoon. Uh, so basically, as rightly mentioned, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, the multi-sectorial multi approach, uh, looking at also uh, the preventive outcome for uh, well-being of children. Uh, first, uh, as a way of start, we are going to have a quick reflection. Uh, uh, Julie? Okay. Yes, so uh, we're going to have a Bentimeter reflection. Uh, I think the link has already been dropped. So basically in your experience, what has been the biggest challenge in working in different sectors in an integrated way, just to have some reflection uh, based on your own experience and understanding. Yes, we have started a reflection, having the right partners and work effectively together. Poor coordination, building trust, scarce resources, identifying ways of internal and coordinated referrals. Confidence at first. Different priorities, different guidelines addressing challenges, having a common outcome instead, having a common minimal understanding of each sector, Difficult interagency collaboration, lack of prioritization of cases by partners. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that reflection. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to be having a background uh, uh, from experience from the Nigerian context. Uh, basically, the project I'm going to be talking about uh, started in June, August 2021 uh, to July 2022. And uh, as earlier mentioned, it is an integrated education, child protection, and nutrition activities. And uh, it was implemented in the Northeast Nigeria, uh, basically in Borro, Dambo, and Pulka, and in Adamo, Mubi North, and Mubi South. Uh, this project was led by Street Child in partnership with uh, Gold Strong Foundation, which had a focus on the child protection component. We have Gender Equality, Peace, and Development Center, JEPASI which focus on the education component while we have life at base development initiative LABDI, uh, which focus on the nutrition activities. Yeah. Next slide, please. And of course the grant value is around 751,471 uh, implemented within a year. So basically uh, for the intervention, the intervention alignment to the primary preventive framework and so-called uh, Psychological model, uh, basically looking at the primary prevention, secondary and tertiary, tertiary prevention. And for the uh, primary prevention, basically it look at the root cause of uh, harms uh, facing children within the communities, targeting all community members. While for the secondary, secondary prevention, uh, it focuses on those at high categories, basically looking at 
uh, the bear unaccompanied children experiencing violence, abuse, and exploitation. While for the tertiary prevention, it focuses on those people that are survivors of harm, but also to ensure that they are better supported to not to be further exposed. Uh, using the ecological model, street child and partners engage uh, using the ecological model at different layers, uh, starting from the child, the family, community, and society. And the activity that, that was implemented during this implementation, basically working with children, it's centered around life skill session, uh, PSS recreational activities, and also participatory dialogue. Uh, this fora also provide opportunities where children themselves express some of those risk factors within the community and collectively come out with uh, safety measures to see how those risks or harm can be mitigated. In terms of uh, working with, uh, with the families, uh, some of the key activities that was implemented during the implementation phase centered at our positive parenting session, which was also mainstream into nutrition activities, looking at the mother to mother support group to ensure that parents are aware and also they prevent any protection or risk facing children under their care. We also have opportunity to provide counseling at communities of implementation for those uh, parent caregivers at risk to ensure that they have better understanding and well supported to ensure they continue to provide protective framework for children under their care and also uh, within the community. We also have community awareness raising basically targeting families and also caregivers to ensure that they better understand some of the risk factors and how they can also uh, mitigate that in a coordinated manner. Uh, at the layer of the community level, we ensure that we also strengthen capacity, basically looking at working with different protection support groups, like the Ch Child Protection Committee, uh, the SBMCs, and also some of the uh, nutrition lead focal point within the communities, where their, uh, their capacity was enhanced to ensure they, uh, they have better uh, knowledge in terms of preventive measures, but also to ensure that they are providing the enabling environment for care and protection for children under their, 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 their care. Also awareness and sensitization, basically focusing on some of the preventive measures, but also to ensure that uh, uh, communities are well equipped in terms of some of the risk factors being faced by children and also how they can be better supported. This on forum also we have uh, uh, a community dialogue session where extensive discussion were held to ensure that also some of the risk factors facing children are also discussed and collectively as a, 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 with the community will come up with community action plan where mitigation measures are also put in place. And at the society level, as part of the, uh, the part of this intervention also, we're able to also facilitate advocacy level, both at community, state, and also at national level. And some of the outcome is also the domestication of the Child Rights Act that was implemented within the areas of implementation, most especially within the Northeast Nigeria. And uh, this has also provided an enabling environment to ensure that our children are better supported. Next slide, please. Yeah, some of the added value uh, of the consortium output, as you have rightly mentioned, uh, one of those things that was, ad, uh, was achieved during the implementation phase is to ensure uh, children receive holistic service package, most especially looking at the three thematic that uh, the integration was focusing on. Uh, children have better protection and also cross referral within child protection, nutrition and education. For those children at risk, they are better supported through uh, comprehensive case management, psychosocial support and also life skill. We also have uh, the nutrition component as earlier highlighted, where we work with uh, most especially under five children and uh, their caregivers where they are well informed in terms of providing preventive measures to care for their children and also enhance the well-being of those children. For those children also facing protection school uh, risks that are also out of school, the integration and flexibility within the project also support in uh, having cross referral uh, within the implementation phase where those students are also better supported in coordination with the implementing partner Jefferson who provide uh, focused education activities uh, during the implementation phase. Just to also add that additional added value was also working closely with the government line ministries across all the sectors, like uh, uh, in Nigeria, the social locals like the Ministry of Women Affairs, we also have uh, uh, the Ministry of Health who support the nutrition component and also uh, some of uh, the cluster uh, 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 agencies, more especially like the uh, areas of responsibility, like the child protection area of responsibility. We have also the education cluster and the nutrition cluster, where in some cases, based on the implementation and the lessons learned, where we have gap, we see how we also advocate uh, at, with those cluster, where there are also capacity, need, the cluster need also provide those guidance and also capacity assistance to ensure that also uh, partners are better supported, but also communities are well supported in terms of providing preventive framework 
uh, within the implementation of uh, location. So basically, this has come up with strong lessons and also added value, ensuring that working across multi-sectoral approach has a better uh, positive outcome to enhancing the well-being and also providing preventive measures to uh, children at risk and also to those that are uh, 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 already experienced risk that are survivors of those violence within those communities, which we have seen evidence at the cause of this implementation. At this point, I will hand over to my colleague, Jabani, who is going to also take us through some of the key achievements uh, in addition to the ad added value uh, of the implementation. Thank you. Over to you, Jabani. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Elam, uh, <laughs> for that elaborate uh, explanation of uh, our implementation here in Nigeria on the consortium uh, project. Uh, of course, uh, talking about uh, the key achievements of uh, this consortium project we implemented with uh, the multi-sectoral uh, the multi-sectoral uh, consortium project implemented. Uh, the key, uh, key achievements uh, are one, uh, positive impact on acceptance, ownership, and uh, sustainability, uh, strengthening partners' capacity for quality program uh, delivery, and strengthening a uh, protective uh, framework. And of course, I'm uh, mainstreaming cash transfer to address needs and mitigate uh, protection risks. And now these highlighted achievements are evidence of the added value and key outcomes uh, delivered during uh, the implementation uh, basis of uh, the project we actually implemented. And of course, community were empowered to focus on continuous outcomes uh, of children. Uh, so these, among others, are part of the achievements that this project has actually uh, yielded. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Now, uh, we'll be looking at the challenges and, of course, opportunities uh, that this the implementation came along with. Uh, part of the challenges uh, include a limited uh, partners for holistic service delivery. Of course, the work out there is much, a lot of children are, are in need of uh, various services across the various thematics. But, of course, uh, we have limited partners here at the field to be able to reach out and respond to their uh, needs. Now, uh, we have limited government structures in a uh, deep field location, which, which was one of the challenges uh, in the course of implementing this uh, project. And of course, natural disaster impact impacted on the uh, intervention. Of course, uh, there were some factors that we identified at the initial stage of uh, the implementation, but uh, uh, some of the factors that were beyond our reach was uh, the natural uh, disaster, especially uh, the flooding that uh, we experienced uh, during the implementation, which has also uh, affected or impacted on the intervention and exposed children to further protection uh, risks, such like uh, cholera, uh, damaged school, uh, CFS landing spaces, and, and the likes. And of course, uh, uh, security and uh, access, uh, access limitations uh, is one of our major uh, challenges, despite several efforts by uh, stakeholders and governments in order to curtail uh, the uh, conflict. But uh, security has continued to actually become uh, a challenge, uh, especially mm -hmm. reaching out those hard to reach areas in the course of uh, implementation. Uh, moving down to opportunities. Uh, there is improved alignment from the design phase of uh, the project we implemented and uh, strengthen uh, advocacy on service delivery is an uh, opportunity uh, to explore. And of course, uh, strengthening community-based programming, uh, it's really an, uh, an area that uh, seems to be open for exploration as opportunity. Uh, thank you. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. And uh, I'll also pass uh, the mantle to Elam for some responses as well to also continue. Thank you and over. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jabani, for that reflection. Uh, basically, we want to also use this opportunity to have another Mentimeter reflection. And uh, looking at also this approach is also one of its kind and uh, that had a lot of added value. The link has already been passed, uh, have been placed in the chat box. Please uh, 
So basically, we are going to be looking at, based on the centrality of children and their protection, what else should have been considered to enhance the program uh, for replication? Because uh, it came out with a lot of positive evidence, but we are happy to take reflection in terms of what can be done better in terms of future programming, looking at the integrated approach in enhancing protective framework for children. So feel free to share your experience, provide recommendation and uh, innovation to see how this project can be improved uh, in terms of future replication. National policy connection, these are valid input identifying three points for other key sectors to enhance the protection of children and address their multidimensional needs. Effective mobilization and advocacy for advancing the rights of the child of children with or without disability. Link to legal framework. These are very valid contribution, and uh, we're noting that. Involve the government at the planning stage so that uh, you do not experience structural blockage during implementations. Yes, these are very valid points, well noted and to be considered. Yeah, systematic guideline, coordination and referral system. Yes, this is a very valid point and well noted to be considered in future planning. Uh, engagement of, exist of existing structures. Yeah, this is a very valid point. Involved in this community and stakeholders. Uh, this is a very valid contribution, well noted. Uh, national campaigns to increase knowledge on the child rights, and nutrition, communication and advocacy. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the reflection and uh, many thanks for your audience. All these points are well noted, are very valid. And uh, at this point, I hand over back to Julie. Over to you, Julie, thank you. Thank you, Elam, and uh, uh, thank you, Giovanni, and uh, thanks to all the participants for uh, your uh, valid uh, inputs in this uh, exercise. Uh, and uh, like, uh, thank you both for, um, like, I think, uh, showing like uh, how this uh, holistic um, uh, package of uh, services uh, to tackle issues from a multi-sectoral perspective uh, has uh, showed this impact uh, on uh, ownership of communities, on uh, sustainability, on uh, strength and capacities, uh, on positive um, uh, protection outcomes for uh, uh, children that show the, the validity of, of this uh, uh, way of working like across uh, uh, sectors. Um, now we wanted to continue our uh, journey uh, showing uh, another program example uh, and uh, this time we zoom in to understand uh, how recruitment of uh, children in uh, armed forces uh, and armed groups uh, can be prevented and also responded to by adopting a holistic uh, multisectoral uh, approach. Again, if you have uh, any reflection, uh, thoughts uh, or uh, questions, you are welcome to share them uh, in uh, the chat during the next uh, uh, presentation. And uh, at this point, I'm uh, um, pleased to welcome uh, here John Garang Nell, who is a program coordinator at World Child Holland in South Sudan, and Florence Paul, who is the policy and partnership lead at the Community Initiative for Development Organization, SIDO, in South Sudan. Uh, John and Florence, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we are happy to be here. As you said, we are going to share uh, our experience in the action that we have taken together as a consortium. Uh, the action is about preventing and protecting children from recruitment in armed forces and armed group. This is in South Sudan. Uh, as I mentioned, the consortium is for three agencies, Dennis River G Council, World Child Holland, and Community Initiative for Development Organization. Next. Yeah, uh, as I know, we want to have a small understanding through this story 
the story of a child that who was uh, recruited into armed force, but through the program, he was demobilized and integrated into the community. Uh, this is the story. I gave up fighting. I wanted to have a normal life. However, society does not accept me because they still judge me on my fast. I want to do everything I can to be useful to the society and change their perception about me and other young people. In this story, we have seen how different this child said. He said he lost his normal life. He said he lost his acceptance. He also he lost his uh, self-esteem. And he has some ability in his mind. He said he want to change. He said he want to give a fight. Next. Yes, we want to take you through and think through this question so that now, how do we and how do you contribute from your idea? Go on, thank you. Let's go into discussion. What work to prevent, to protect children from recruitment into armed forces? What elements are needed for, for comprehensive programming? Yes. So in your full group, you continue working and contribute. Thank you. You have seen the link, send in your understanding. What will be done for that child to come to normalcy in a holistic, multi-sectoral and multi-level approach? Coordination, training the armed group chief and the community, thank you. Yes, providing livelihood and education opportunity, mental health side effect, understanding the armed group, power dynamic at play, thank you. Community awareness, uh, strengthening the security system, thank you. International protection and awareness, thank you. Advocacy and sensitization, good, thank you. Yeah, good coordination between stakeholders working on the issue. Thank you. Gender sensitivity, great. Yeah, these are very valid points. Uh, we love them. Yeah, these are the right action where we have our holistic approach, child-centered. Nice team, livelihood, incoming, generating activities. Yeah, great. This is nice one. Thank you, all of this one, of course. Great. Yes, great. 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 Thank you, great. Thank you, thank you for contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Has you seen that this, uh, this action was funded by the Canadian government and implemented by the three uh, partners in the consortium. And the action is to increase protection of boys, girls affected by an associated with armed conflicts in one of the areas. In South Sudan, we have three conflicts political conflict, economic conflict, and social conflict, and even legal conflict. And all these conflict involve armed, and all children are affected. Next. Thank you. Yes, we have a sick uh, program areas which have been uh, mainstream to respond to this. So we have child protection, where we have case management, we dealing responding to issues, demobilization of children, integration of children into communities, working with stakeholders. We also have education, where we make sure children are demobilized and as facilitate to assess his education. We also have uh, mental health and psychosocial support, where we are facilitating uh, child child friendly spaces life skills uh, and peer-to-peer -peer discussion. We also have livelihoods, 
Next. Where we have livelihood, where we have, uh, yes, thank you. I will run over to my colleague to take me through this. Thank you. Welcome, Florence. You are muted. Open your mic. Thank you, John. When it comes to GBV prevention and peace building, we work uh, using the SASA and SASA together, which are evidence-based methodologies that have worked uh, very well across Africa. And uh, this uh, methodology actually demonstrates the good evidences on prevention of violence at community level and has been adopted uh, uh, in countries such as where we are in South Sudan. So it has worked well and we really appreciate these uh, methodologies that was developed uh, in 2008 by Raising Voices. Uh, it actually aims at the, uh, reducing or transforming imbalances of power between men and women by sparking uh, community uh, wide critical discussions and positive actions to protect uh, women and girls. So as CEDO, Watchild, and uh, DRC, we work by training community activists to be able to work with communities to prevent all forms of violence, uh, maybe physical violence, uh, emotional. So uh, work to build a critical mass of stakeholders who can influence change in terms of changing the behavior, changing the social norms, and also uh, impacting on the policies. Uh, we also have another model that we work with, which is called the, the Girls Shine Curriculum. This, was, this is a curriculum that was developed by IRC, and it has worked well uh, in South Sudan. We are using it. This also aims at um, to contribute to the improved prevention and response to violence against adolescents girls of the age of 10 to 19 years. Uh, so how we do this, we provide them with skills and knowledge to identify the types of gender-based violence affecting them. And we also uh, empower them on how to seek support. And this is done in several uh, um, uh, tailored settings, uh, notably we uh, which help us to do this, facilitated by social workers who are skilled and also community facilitators. Why we do this is we realize that CAFAG, uh, there are harmful practices that are, are triggered or trigger CAFAG. Uh, in, in our setting in South Sudan, we have issues to do with cattle riding or cattle wrestling, uh, cultural beliefs, which are when these things happen, uh, there are grave violations of children, including abductions, uh, including sexual violence, including forced marriages. We also recognize that in need, uh, there's need to equip communities to better deal with stigma uh, by, by empowering them to understand their roles and how they can contribute to providing psychosocial support at their level to families who have uh, CAFAG children. We also recognize that uh, reintegration processes is much easier when communities understand their roles and when communities participate actively in the prevention of violence. Uh, when it comes to peace building, we, we recognize the role of women in contributing to peace. Uh, in conflict situation. Uh, as conflict is one of the major causes of violence against children and women. We do this by strengthening women's, the women's roles uh, as their care caregivers, as influencers, as decision makers, for them to be able to say no to child abductions, to be able to be, say no to sexual violence, and to be able to say no to recruitment of children into armed groups. So how we do this, we do this through capacity building of women groups, of women leaders on peace building approaches and social cohesion. We also support community level forums to come up with action plans for violence prevention and promotion of uh, child rights. So basically in a nutshell, uh, these are the two components uh, that uh, complement what John has just described. Thank you, over to you, John. Next slide. John, you're muted. Yes, we have emerging results. And in the emerging results, we, as we said, from the module we are using, we have community leaders taking ownership and facilitate the return of the children who are abducted. And from the project time that we implemented, we managed to uh, negotiate through the community stakeholders the children who have been abducted by the community protection use and return to their family and integrated. That could, is one of the results. Another result 
uh, through the through the community dialogue parenting, uh, we managed to have a group a number of parents who have attend parenting session for positive parenting. We also have number of uh, adults, adults who have attend community dialogue and, and caregivers to be effectively change their attitude, change their mentality, change their practice so that children should be protected. Also, we have uh, all this protection. Next. Next slide. Yes. Yeah. The same. Yeah. The same thing with the result. We also have the attitude working with the institution, teachers in the school, and also the the steering committee. The we have we are working through the level with the family, with the community, with the institution, and with the government structures in prevention. We make sure. They are the, through training, through awareness. Yeah, in prevention, we create a livelihood. Like now in this project, we have over 400 children who have been um, who have been demobilized, radicalized, and supported with livelihood. And the results show that we have 80 percent adult who have with the family supported. We have 90 percent who have shown the changes in their life. And that assured. Yeah, thank you. Next. Yes, I will hand over to my colleague to take over these parts, but all that he can give us also. I already mentioned that we have a six program areas which have been uh, who have been mainstream, and the four are integrated and two are integrated. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, thank you, John. So when it comes to results, more results on, uh, on uh, GBV prevention, we've noted uh, significant strides in primary violence prevention. Uh, we have seen actions, uh, this is actions uh, before violence actually uh, begins, in terms of communities are able to identify uh, the triggers of violence, to identify the, the early warnings, uh, to identify uh, the early warnings and actually work on them. For example, be able at family level, be able to identify conflict and actually work on it before it actually erupts into a, a physical or any other form of violence. So um, we've measured this through uh, uh, monitoring mechanisms and also the, through the outcome harvesting processes. And we've seen uh, um, significant strides when it comes to secondary violence prevention, referring to violence, uh, active violence, that, or violence that happened after it has happened. So we see uh, there's increased reporting in terms of uh, uh, victims or witnesses. They are able to report the, the the violence that has happened to them or to their friends or to their colleagues, uh, or using actually what we call the referral pathways. And at some extent, some are able to provide uh, psychosocial support or psychosocial first aid uh, to the survivors. We've also seen them be being able to take actions, like through taking power and also about uh, having power and recognizing that uh, these, these are the forms of violence that are not uh, appropriate and then uh, take, making sure that uh, similar cases uh, of the violence that, that they have of, of uh, witness do not happen to actually to their peers. Uh, we've also seen tremendous support for and responsiveness uh, by local government, whereby there is enactment of bylaws uh, uh, for prevention of child marriages and also implementation of family laws and also uh, there is punishment of perpetrators. Um, in, when it comes to the part of peace building, we've seen uh, tremendous strides in the inclusion of women uh, in peace initiatives like uh, consultations and decision makings, and for also uh, in issues to do with the planning and implementation of peace initiatives. Uh, we've also seen women being engaged in advocacy issues to do with peace building, and there's also a, a formation of alliances, they've built alliances whereby women are able to, to come together strongly and uh, advocate against ethnic violence uh, in cross, across the 
counties. Uh, we've also seen uh, active monitoring of cases by the stakeholders, uh, where we call them the state steering committee, who are actually in charge of monitoring the six grades violations against children. These have come out uh, very well to actually support uh, the women in, in doing the monitoring of these grave uh, violations and monitoring uh, and reporting them. Uh, when it comes to uh, stigma, we've seen a formation of anti-stigma movements and more uh, accommodation of families uh, with the Catholic children and more appreciation of the reintegration processes in the communities that we work with. Thank you so much. Over to you, John. Next slide, please. Yeah, I think uh, thank you very much. We are happy. We have some challenges that we did not put on the slides. We know one of the challenges, this action was funded for only 18 months. And during the next, uh, in August, uh, we shall be having the GAF. And other challenges, so Sudan has many, many conflict areas. And we are only in, in one, in, in one, two areas, Greater Pivot and Jongle State. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Over to you, Kerry. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you, Florence. And uh, thank you also for uh, highlighting uh, some of the challenges, which I think are um, quite common, like uh, working on uh, short-term funding, wanting to reach uh, longer-term uh, uh, objectives. But at the same time, we see also so many promising results at different levels, as uh, you have uh, highlighted in uh, the family, in the community, in uh, strengthening uh, protective uh, structures, uh, and uh, how all uh, these uh, to prevent recruitment of uh, children in uh, armed forces and uh, our groups uh, took uh, a um, coordinated and multi-sectoral uh, uh, approach. Now, uh, thank you to all uh, our speakers. And maybe if we can uh, identify some uh, common uh, threats ac across uh, our presentations. I wanted to highlight like uh, how our speakers uh, help us uh, show that uh, children's needs are uh, holistic and uh, each sector can uh, influence and uh, contribute to children's protection uh, and uh, well-being. And often we see how the root causes of um, uh, child protection harmful outcomes uh, uh, lay across the sectors. Uh, as it was mentioned, maybe the lack of um, uh, safe education or lack of livelihoods might make children uh, more vulnerable to um, harmful outcomes like a child labor or recruitment in armed forces or uh, and armed groups. So that the work that uh, all sectors uh, do contributes to reduce uh, harm uh, to children, and then the importance of uh, having a holistic multi-sectoral approach to prevent and respond uh, to harm, which is um, core to achieve uh, our collective responsibility, to uphold the centrality of uh, uh, protection and uh, ensure improved uh, uh, outcomes for uh, children. Now, since we have uh, a bit of time, uh, we wanted to take a few questions for uh, our speakers. So I will start from uh, uh, some questions and the reflect reflections that uh, already came uh, uh, through the chat or came to me as a message. And uh, I would like to address the first question to um, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, if you wouldn't mind to share uh, uh, an advice to child protection actors uh, on uh, how we can strengthen collaboration with uh, health actors in the humanitarian uh, settings. Yeah, thanks very much for the, the question and thanks to the other presenters, really fascinating work. Um, so I think uh, maybe my first recommendation would just be to be aware of the, the health uh, care professionals who are working in the, in the field and to know sort of what they, um, their focus areas are and to recognize that they could well be seeing uh, cases of abuse um, and that they uh, could be, uh, the, that they play an important role in recognizing that and uh, responding to the child. And that maybe, uh, I mean, perhaps the healthcare professional also requires a training in that, but I think uh, uh, to reach out to those healthcare professionals um, and to say what your role would be, um, what you do, and then for the healthcare professional also to explain 
what their their role is. Um, and in the handbook that I had mentioned earlier, I mean, part of that process is also the, the referral mechanisms. And so we are trying to train healthcare professionals at the front line to really work within their field and to say, okay, who else is working in your field and actually list all of that. So I think it goes both ways that um, healthcare professionals should be reaching out to help protection and vice versa. Um, so that it can be a more coherent and multi-sectorial approach uh, for for dealing with um, the children, and so that the, you know the healthcare worker plays an important role in terms of the, the medical care, but also the psychosocial care, um, and that together with uh, child protection uh, officers, uh, it would be better to work together. Over. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. And uh, there was a reflection in uh, the chat uh, during uh, uh, your presentation, Elam and Giovanni. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the reflection and the question was about uh, how you draw the line uh, and you balance between uh, taking uh, an integrated uh, multisectoral approach, uh, but on the other side, uh, working with the uh, limited budgets. Hi, Clara. I guess that question is for me. Okay, thank you so much, uh, colleagues, for the wonderful presentation and also for uh, raising that question. So in terms of how we uh, utilize the limited budget uh, under the multi-sectoral intervention, one, we try to ensure that uh, we have a complementary uh, referral pathway within the consortium partners, where we ensure that within our availability of budget, we try to ensure that also we utilize uh, those resources and expertise to provide that support, most especially looking at the response to Mati. And another area, we try to also strengthen our coordination with uh, uh, the existing uh, uh, coordination platform and also utilizing the referral pathway at the field level. For those uh, of referral pathway that are very functional, we also coordinate with other humanitarian uh, work us to see how we facilitate referral of those consigned cases to see how we can also uh, 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 utilize those support in complementing what we are doing. In addition to that, some of the, some of the locations like uh, in uh, Borno, we also have complementary intervention where uh, apart from the multi-sectorial response, we also have other funded projects where we also see how we facilitate that uh, referral with the agency to see how they are better supported. But of course, uh, to ensure that also we continue to advocate uh, for those things. So basically, this is some of the approach that uh, we use to have that cost referral within the consortium, but also utilizing the referral pathway across sectors and also ensuring that we're utilizing com complementary funding in locations where we are also implementing the multisectoral approach. So basically, but of course, as clearly highlighted, the resources are limited. And vis-a-vis uh, -vis the needs also on ground is things that we also not as some of our key lessons, and we continue to advocate across all the thematic of uh, the integration that we responded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elam. I just wanted to check if uh, Giovanni wanted to add uh, anything to your uh, reflections before we move to the next uh, question. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me. In Indeed, uh, Elam has actually said it all. Uh, the need is actually enormous at uh, those respective uh, locations or communities where we did this implementation, and the budget has been very, very limited. But of course, uh, with the need that is there on the ground, we had to make use of the available resources to be able to reach uh, those uh, beneficiaries or project participants, uh, especially bearing in mind the uh, most vulnerable or considering their vulnerability uh, stage when it comes to also providing the services uh, that we actually implemented. But of course, uh, uh, more advocacy uh, it's on, resource, uh, on resource and funding is uh, actually a priority for us because uh, it's obvious that the needs are innermost out there. Thank you very much, Anova. Thank you, Giovanni. And uh, we have a couple of uh, questions uh, um, now to John and Florence. Uh, the first question is, um, 
like if you can, uh, uh, as you spoke uh, about um, good coordination and uh, the effects of uh, coordination in uh, your program, like uh, what uh, advice for effective coordination with other sectors uh, you can give when working in the same uh, community? Yes, for us in South Sudan, uh, we are working through uh, humanitarian coordination and also with some of the state uh, line ministries. And in humanitarians, we have the system uh, which is led by the, uh, the OHA and which also coordinating all the clusters. And we have the interagent uh, system. We also have intercluster system and we have different clusters. And all these support the coordination and also support uh, how the programming and how the how we how we place ourselves to avoid duplication in a, in a response and also to cover gap. So it is one of the one of the effective from our work that we have here. Uh, the challenges or limitation that the coordination have is on term of um, uh, a continuation challenges that the country have through the 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 hardship that we have in this in the area where we have issues of uh, infrastructure issues of uh, conflicts that are active and issues of uh, economic situation which are uh, Cause, cause situation of humanitarian situation. So yeah, in terms of coordination, uh, we, we are effective. Another challenge is the other counterpart, the government counterpart. There are some areas where the government structures are still low. So their contribution sometimes is, uh, is challenging the humanitarian system. Uh, take example like the area of the areas whereby there are no in proper institution, there are no proper policing, there are no proper 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 legal system. So what what is what is beyond the humanitarian is uh, what is beyond the humanitarian or what is at the level of the government sometimes also constrained. So I can also send to my colleague to add. Thank you. I think, thank you, John, that was well covered. Thank you. And actually there was uh, right after that, uh, a, a, um, another question for that came during your intervention. Uh, and someone was curious to know if you have programs uh, for children who have been associated to um, uh, armed groups and uh, have fled their uh, home countries and live uh, in uh, camps across the world. If maybe you can uh, say a word about it. Yeah, as I mentioned in South Sudan, uh, there is uh, diversity in armed arm, arm conflicts. We have uh, armed conflicts that are led by the by the recognized militia or regular armed forces. And there are armed conflicts which are being uh, conducted by community protection group or a group that are not recognized. So, and in this situation, uh, on conventional basis, the, 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 um, the armed conflict of the children who are associated through community protection group, uh, accountability or reporting, monitoring and reporting mechanism is not captured because uh, the system is only uh, recognizing that accountability should be on the on the regular forces or on the on the on the on the clear militia structures, so that is what we are experiencing as one of the one of the thing. So the way we are handling is through prevention effort, where we had explained before, engaging children themselves to avoid, engaging parents to avoid, 
engaging uh, stakeholders who are also to support to avoid children involvement in community armed group. Thank you, John. Um, and then I'm going back to Elam and Jabani. There is um, a question from Lucy in the chat. Uh, what structures has your team put in place for sustainability? Okay, thank you, Claire. Thank you, uh, colleagues, for asking that, that question. Uh, but especially in the uh, multi-sectoral approach, we try to ensure that we work with relevant stakeholders from the uh, from the design stage to the uh, entry to the implementation and to the closeout phase. Like for uh, the child protection component, we work closely with the committee, the child protection committee. We strengthen their capacity and also their committed which we have also shown evidence, most especially after the project have faced out in terms of continue to provide some uh, mitigation measures and also support to children as part of sustainability and uh, ownership of the intervention. Looking at the education component, also work with relevant education authorities like uh, Ministry of Education and uh, the uh, School-Based Management Committee to ensure that they are fully involved from uh, throughout the design and also the implementation phase and also they are sustaining and taking ownership uh, of those intervention. Likewise, also the nutrition in terms of relevant uh, key stakeholders to uh, do that. Just to also highlight that uh, uh, during the implementation phase across uh, the various thematic, all the relevant stakeholders, including the, uh, the direct beneficiaries, more especially the children are well informed in terms of what is expected and also ensure participatory approach for the community to have clear roles and responsibility with commitment of ensuring that they are going to sustain, which we have shown that evidence, through the support they provided during the implementation cycle. And also at, at the end of the implementation, uh, looking at locations where we have ongoing complementary intervention, we see also the, most, the community communities and also the support structures demonstrating that uh, evidence of ownership and sustainability to those interventions. So sustainability is key. And uh, one key thing also as highlighted during the presentation in terms of the added value is also our work with the relevant government structures like the ministries, Looking at whatever humanitarian intervention we are doing, we are complementing the effort of the government. We ensure that they are carried along, they are aware, and in some cases during the implementation, we also conduct joint monitoring visits so that they will have a direct understanding of those uh, implementation approach, the communities, target communities we are implementing, and to see how they will continue to complement even at the end of the project. The relationship has been there. Uh, street child and partners are also very relevant with the, within the context. And in some cases also, uh, we still have a ongoing project in some locations where we're still building on the, the lessons learned from the integrated project. And that uh, is something that will ensure that uh, at the cost of the implementation, sustainability is key. And we're happy that the communities have accepted, they are fully involved and they are sustaining those intervention as part of our lessons learned. Just to add from that point of, of view, I don't know if Jabani, in case maybe you have any addition to that, uh, over to you, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Elam. Uh, just uh, to add on that, uh, just uh, is uh, on the part of uh, the government, uh, and just like you said, we carried them along, uh, and all the relevant stakeholders uh, from the beginning of the project down to the closure, uh, they were all engaged actively and participated uh, at every step of it. Uh, this has actually made them understand what the programming was all about across the various thematics and. Uh, uh, of course, they also contributed their quota, especially those uh, government uh, stakeholders, because we know that uh, many at times when policies uh, from agencies usually pull out. And of course, having understood the uh, importance of working with uh, government agencies, I think we worked uh, hand in hand all the way. For the community structures that uh, we have actually uh, uh, built their capacity uh, immensely, because uh, for some of those community structures that were inactive or dormant, we reactivated and also uh, ensured that their capacities were strengthening, were strengthened to some extent that they, on their own, were also implementing and also uh, providing some of the services within uh, their, their community. And just like Elam also said, we, at our part, also continue to go, even, uh, go and uh, provide some of the services even after uh, the, the project implementation by providing some uh, mentoring coaching to those uh, community existing structures which uh, 
has greatly improved and ensured that the project is, uh, I mean, the program is uh, actually sustained across those uh, locations. Thank you very much, and over. Thank you, Elam. Thank you, Giovanni. And we have uh, one uh, very last uh, question in the chat. This is a time from uh, John for uh, John and uh, Florence. Uh, Ali asks, uh, what about the obligation of uh, children population census and registration in humanitarian camps and conflict areas? So how you dealt with those issues in your program? Yeah, thank you very much. In, uh, in, in, in South Sudan, we have a, a, a counterpart system that deal with the, the children who are, who are associated with armed forces and armed conflicts. And that's whereby we have the DDR commission, which is the, a counterpart working together with the, the United Nations Task Force. And they are the one uh, helping us in documenting the population of the children who are affected by armed conflicts. Uh, in the census of the current year, they have uh, 19,000 in the data, which has been uh, captured in the in South Sudan conflict areas, and that are only accountable to the in, in name of institution of the of the of the of the armed forces but the children who are the children who are in hand of the and are, who are in hand of the community protection youth they are not being registered thank you thank you john checking if florence wants to add anything before we close our session for the day yeah, I think uh, John has captured it well. Uh, we don't have really formal ways of uh, doing the census for our uh, children, the children that we work with. Uh, basically, what we do, it depends on head count and also uh, some of the data that our partners are having, including some of the data that the government, uh, uh, various uh, government uh, officials or departments have. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah, in addition answer. to that, in terms of the number that we work with, we have the our project targets that we have reached, and those are those are the numbers we have currently. We have the census of the population in the areas we work in. So, like for example, in 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 the in the areas where we work on re, re, demobilization and integration. We are, we are targeting uh, uh, 300 children for this action where we have achieved uh, around 200 who are already being demobilized and now integrated with the community and we are still working now. Thank you. Thanks, John. And we could continue this discussion for uh, much longer. So once again, thank you to all our speakers. Thanks to Stephanie, Elam, Giovanni, John, uh, Florence. Uh, many thanks to Manami from the Alliance Secretariat for uh, supporting the organization of this session, to Julie and Lisa, our producers, to Alex, who has drawn the main messages uh, um, from uh, the session in uh, his beautiful uh, drawings. And uh, at this point, we, um, uh, you find the closing poll in the chat. Uh, please click on it and uh, let us know your um, uh, feedback so we know what we can uh, improve also for uh, uh, next uh, uh, meetings. Mm -hmm.